social responsibility. We're grateful to the Tucan alum for hosting this event, and we thank you all for joining us today. It's very intrusive. Uh, we're moved to plan this event because of concerns over the rising threat of nuclear war, which is such a huge and scary issue that many of us can't even discuss it. Today, Dr. Helfen will introduce us to Back from the Brink, and there are brochures on the back table and flyers about Back from the Brink. It's a national campaign to prevent nuclear war, and Dr. Helfen will explain how we can expand the base of support for it. Our goal is that Dr. Helfen's talk will inspire us to take action and make the world safer than it currently is. The program today will be as follows. Dr. Helfen's presentation will be about a half an hour, followed by 15 minutes for small group sharing among ourselves. Then Dr. Helfen will take a half hour question and answer period. In conclusion, Dr. Helfen will share information on the role we can each take in preventing nuclear war. People will leave these few hours armed with knowledge and inspired to act. As we conclude, please do join us for light refreshments and an opportunity to write postcards at the back of the hall. Now I have the honor of introducing Dr. Helfand. Dr. Ira Helfand is a member of the International Steering Committee of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which was the recipient of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. He is also co-president of IPPNW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which was the recipient of the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize. And he is also co-founder and past president of the Physicians for Social Responsibility. Ira has published on the medical consequences of nuclear war in the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, and the New World Medical Journal. He's also a fre frequent contributor to CNN, where he pronounces things better than I do. <laughs> He's lectured widely on the danger of nuclear war, speaking throughout the world, including India, China, Japan, Russia, South Africa, Israel, Pakistan, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and throughout the United States and Europe. He also addressed a special session of the UN General Assembly in September 2015, 12, 2015, right. While doing all of this, Dr. Helfen has continued practicing as a physician and currently is an internist and urgent care physician at Family Care Medical Center in Springfield. Dr. Helfen lives in Leeds and we're fortunate to have him in our community. Ivan? Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I know that you know this is not going to be an easy session, and I appreciate it. Here we go. Okay. Sorry, we have the mic for me because I have such a soft voice. Is that better now? Yes. Okay, thanks. I just want to, again, thank you all for coming. I know that you understand this is not going to be an easy session that we're going to be going through. We're going to be talking about some very difficult things, and I appreciate your willingness to do this. Um, the Holocaust Museum in Washington has got a bunch of really overwhelming, powerful exhibits in it, which you know, talk about and, and show for us the, the horrors of the camps and the ghettos, uh, the suffering of the people who went through the Holocaust. But of all the exhibits there, the one that I find most um, troubling in many ways uh, is a hallway that leads between two of the other exhibits, which is lined on both sides with photographs uh, all of them like snapshots taken from one little town in Poland. And there are pictures taken from 1937, 38, 39, before the war, of everyday life in this community. There are pictures of bar mitzvahs, of weddings, of graduations. Closer? Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, just all kinds of everyday uh, occasions. People in beer gardens, people playing sports, people just sitting with friends in cafes. And the thing about this exhibit is, looking at it, we all know what happened to these people. And 
they kind of knew the danger they were in. They knew what was going on next door in Germany, but they couldn't imagine what was going to happen to their world. And the thing that I find so terrifying about this exhibit is my fear that we are those people. Um, we, you know, on a day like this, gorgeous fall day, we cannot, literally we cannot imagine that all of this could be destroyed. But the fact of the matter is it can be, and it will be, if we don't do something to prevent nuclear war. Uh, back in the 1980s, we all understood this. As I look around this room, I think almost everybody here was part of that political milieu. Some were not, but most were. Uh, we understood that nuclear war was a real possibility, and that if it happened, it was going to destroy the world. And we took action, and it's very important that we did that, uh, both for what it accomplished then and for the inspiration I think it should give to us now. Millions of people in the United States, in Russia, in Europe, took to the streets, they took to the halls of Congress and other government centers, and they forced an end to the Cold War arms race. At that point in the 1980s, there were like 60,000 nuclear warheads in the world. And the US and the Soviet Union were each building about 3,000 more every year. We were racing towards nuclear war. The Reagan administration came into office, pledged to developing the ability to fight and win a nuclear war in Europe. And that was its policy. And within three years of his taking office, the public campaign that we launched here in Western Massachusetts, the Freeze Campaign, had brought about a complete change in US nuclear policy. In the State of the Union Address in January of 1984, Ronald Reagan said, nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. And this was such a complete reversal of the policies that had brought him to office that we mostly missed it at the time. We didn't think it was real. We thought it was just campaign rhetoric for the 84 presidential election. But it turns out it really was a change of heart on this man's part. And it led to a change in his administration. We had met with Reagan. We had met with Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. We mean people in IPPW. I didn't get personally to be involved in either of those meetings. Um, and as a result of those meetings, and as a result of the public pressure that we were creating, and the cultural upswelling, the, the, the movies, the books that were being written, urging people to take action and describing what was going to happen if there were a nuclear war, as a result of all of that, we were able to fundamentally change US nuclear policy and Soviet nuclear policy, and I believe that we saved the world. Unfortunately, when the Cold War ended, we all began to act as though this danger had gone away. And the problem is, the danger hasn't gone away. Our attention to it has. There are still in the world 15,000 nuclear warheads, which is more than enough to destroy the world many, many times over. And we are, in the opinion of people like Secretary, former Secretary of Defense William Perry, closer to nuclear war today than we have ever been, including at the worst moments of the Cold War. And so it is important for us to understand both the imminence of this threat and the enormity of this threat. What's going to happen if these weapons are used? And I want to spend a little bit of time today, not a lot, but a little bit, talking to you about what's going to happen if there is a nuclear war. I suspect that many of you know what I'm going to be talking about. But I also suspect that it won't hurt any of us to be reminded, because we all do a pretty good job of pushing this information out of our minds for the obvious reason that it's really unpleasant to think about it. But as we learned in the 80s, if we don't think about it, we won't act on it. And if we don't act on it, nothing's going to change, and very bad things are going to happen. So let me begin by talking first about excuse me, the increased threat that we're facing, um, why the threat of nuclear war is greater now than it was even five or six years ago. Um, I can identify at least seven reasons why the danger is greater. Four of them relate to geopolitical uh, conflicts, and three of them are other sorts of factors that we need to take into consideration. On the geopolitical side, the, the first and most important is the deterioration of relations between the United States and Russia, which are currently at the worst point they've been in 25 years at least since the end of the Cold War. We were told throughout this period we did not need to worry about nuclear war between the United States and Russia, they were no longer enemies, they were kind of friends, and things were fine. 
as recently as the summer of 2014, I remember a meeting that I had at the State Department with Rose Gottemuller, who was then the Under Secretary of State for nuclear weapons related issues. And she told me the US doesn't even take into account the possibility of a nuclear war with Russia. It's just not something we think about. We only concern ourselves with terrorists and rogue states. Well, I think that approach was wrong then. Events since then have shown it's clearly wrong now uh, with Syria and Ukraine and other issues. The possibility of conflict between the United States and Russia is real, it's growing, and if it happens, there's a very good chance that this will be a nuclear conflict. The second geopolitical area of concern is US-China relations. They're the worst they've been in 40 years. During the last decade of the Cold War, China was essentially an honorary member of NATO, a full partner in the effort to contain the Soviet Union. And the US had a very, very positive relationship. It developed very quickly after uh, the, the earlier period of, of hostility between the United States and China. But it blossomed very quickly into a real partnership and friendship. That's not true anymore. Uh, we are engaged in a very difficult, tense relationship with China for uh, supremacy in East Asia. Uh, there are huge trade issues between us. And there's a military component to this conflict. The US and China naval forces play chicken on a regular basis in the South China Sea, and it is an extremely dangerous situation, which could lead, probably inadvertently in this case, to conflict, which could very rapidly escalate to nuclear conflict. That's the second geopolitical area. The third is the one that I think has gotten the most attention over the last year, and that's the situation in Korea. And we need to understand fully how close we came to war earlier this year. Uh, we truly dodged a bullet. And I think the most important thing to understand is that that bullet hasn't landed yet. It's still ricocheting around, and we don't know what's going to be the ultimate outcome of this situation. For the moment, uh, Trump is having a love fest with his fellow dictator in North Korea, but we're not sure how long this is going to last. At some point, it's going to become undeniable that the North Koreans are not fulfilling their part of the bargain, that they're not disarming their nuclear arsenal. And Trump can respond in one of two ways. He can pretend that that's not true. He can just lie and say that he did score the greatest political diplomatic victory in history that nobody else could possibly have done. Or he could get really angry, which he does also, and revert to you know, fire and fury mode. And we could be right back in the kind of standoff that we were in at the beginning of the year. So it's still a very dangerous situation in the Koreas. The fourth geopolitical area I think is every bit as dangerous, and it gets almost no attention in the United States, and that's the situation in South Asia. India and Pakistan fight almost every day at their border in Kashmir. It's low-level hostility, a few mortar shells, a few artillery rounds, some rifle shots, a couple of people killed on either side of the border. No one who follows events in South Asia closely would be surprised if that fighting escalated into a larger conflict. No one would be surprised if there were another major terrorist attack in India, like the one at the Indian Parliament or at the hotel complex in, in Mumbai, both of which brought these two countries to the brink of war. And there are other ways as well that we can imagine the very tense situation between these countries escalating into a nuclear conflict. Um, so those are the four geopolitical areas that we need to worry about. Uh, there may be a fifth brewing totally unnecessarily with the United States and Iran we did a good job diffusing that situation a few years ago under the Obama administration, and the Trump administration has done everything in its power to reignite that crisis. Uh, in addition to these geopolitical areas, there are at least three other uh, circumstances which contribute to the increased danger. First uh, is climate change, something which we don't want to think about in, as a direct, uh, in direct relationship to nuclear war. The US and the other nuclear weapon states all tell us that it is their hope to eventually get rid of their nuclear weapons. But the time isn't ripe. We have to wait for the future when things are safer, and then we can do it. The problem is the world isn't getting safer. As climate change progresses, as large areas of the world become less able to support their population, conflict is going to become more likely, not less likely. And as this process progresses, if nuclear weapons are still on the table, the chance they're going to be used is increasing. The second of these other non-geopolitical factors is the danger of cyber-terrorism. We used to think that the worst thing that could happen with regards to terrorists and nuclear weapons was that a terrorist group could get hold of one of these and blow up a city. 
New York or Tel Aviv or Moscow, Bombay perhaps. What we now understand is that the real danger is that terrorists could carry out a cyber attack and hack into the command and control systems of the United States or Russia or one of the other nuclear powers and either directly cause the launch of nuclear weapons or perhaps more likely create a false alarm so that the country being hacked believes that it's under actual missile attack from one of its enemies and launches its weapons in response. This is a nightmare. You know, we spend an enormous amount of money on cybersecurity, but despite that, the Pentagon uh, computer systems get hacked into many, many times every day, and people who are responsible for this are terrified that it's just a matter of time before somebody cracks all the way in to the command systems uh, for our nuclear weapons. The final consideration that's making nuclear war more dangerous uh, is the Trump presidency. And I always feel a little bit constrained to talking about this because I do not mean this as a partisan comment. Uh, this is not my assessment. This is the assessment of the security experts in his own party. During the 2016 uh, presidential election, uh, nearly 100 Republican security, national security experts famously issued their statement saying that Donald Trump lacked the knowledge temperament and the judgment to be in command of the nuclear arsenal. Since then, his first Secretary of State is reported to have called him a moron with regard to his understanding of nuclear weapons. Others in the White House have referred to him as an idiot or a fifth grader. It's kind of an insult to fifth graders. Um, this is an extraordinary situation. The U.S. has maintained for decades that it would be intolerable for even a single nuclear weapon to get into what we call the wrong hands, by which we meant a terrorist group or a rogue state. But we have turned 6,800 of these weapons over to the command of Donald Trump, who I think is manifestly unqualified to be in command of the nuclear arsenal. And we have to recognize the enormous danger that we have created with this situation. As long as he's president, this additional factor needs to be taken into account. So for all of these reasons, we have to accept that the use of nuclear weapons, which we fought for a period of time after the Cold War was a problem we did not need to worry about anymore, the use of nuclear weapons remains a real and imminent threat and a growing threat. Let's talk a little bit about what will happen if these weapons are used. And I want to start by talking about limited nuclear war. This is one of in terms of our understanding of nuclear weapons, this is relatively new information. During the 80s, we assumed that it would take a large war between the United States and the Soviet Union to affect the entire planet. What we've discovered in the last decade is that even a much more limited nuclear war, involving a tiny fraction of the world's nuclear weapons, and a war that could take place between smaller nuclear powers, like India and Pakistan, would be disastrous not only for the countries that fought this war, but for the whole planet. The studies that have been done have all looked at a particular scenario in which India and Pakistan go to war and use 50 Hiroshima-sized bombs each on urban targets in the other country. At the time that the first study was published, it was roundly criticized for creating a worst, worst, worst case scenario that was unrealistic. This wouldn't happen. We now understand that India and Pakistan have not 50 nuclear warheads each, but 130 nuclear warheads each. And many of them are three to 10 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. So this scenario that I'm going to describe to you in a minute is actually probably a significant underestimate of what will happen if India and Pakistan do go to war. But it's bad enough. Uh, 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs detonated over urban targets in these two countries killed 20 million people in the first week. From the explosions, from the fires, from the immediate radiation effects. And to put that in perspective, during all of World War II, about 50 million people died over the course of eight years over the entire globe. This is going to be 20 million people, maybe 30 million people, uh, in one small corner of the globe in the course of a week. But the global effects are even more catastrophic. These weapons put about five and a half to six and a half million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere, blocking out the sun, cooling the planet, drying the planet, shortening the growing season. And as a result of this worldwide climate disruption, food production throughout the world also declines because of these adverse conditions. And as a result of that, 
there's a worldwide famine, which we have estimated could put up to two billion, with a B, two billion people at risk of starvation. The death of two billion people over the course of a decade would not be the extinction of our species. It would be the end of modern civilization. No civilization in history has ever withstood a shock of this magnitude. And there is no reason to assume that the very fragile, interconnected economic system which we all depend on would survive a shock of this magnitude. We all saw what the housing bubble did to the world economy in 2008. We're talking about disruption that is orders and orders and orders of magnitude larger. And our current economic system would collapse under this strain. That's a limited nuclear war. A large-scale nuclear war, as we must understand is still possible, would be far worse. Um, I want to describe this briefly just by describing to you what happens in a single city. Most of us have images in our minds someplace in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the experience there, the destruction of those two cities, is a very important warning of what nuclear weapons can do. But the most important thing we need to understand about Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that they do not begin to prepare us for what a modern nuclear war would look like. A large city like Boston would not be targeted with one Hiroshima-sized bomb. It would be tar targeted with something like 10 to 15 to maybe 20 bombs, each of which are 30 to 50 times bigger than the Hiroshima bomb. And these weapons would create a fireball reaching out for two miles in every direction from the center of the attack, four miles across. In this area, the temperatures would rise to 20 million degrees, which is hot on the surface of the sun and everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the trees, the people, the upper level of the earth itself would disappear. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobiles would melt. And to a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense still that everything flammable would burn. Cloth, plastic, paper, wood, gasoline, heating oil, it would all ignite. Hundreds of thousands of fires, which over the next half hour would coalesce into a firestorm, 32 miles across, covered over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature would rise to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the oxygen would be consumed, and every living thing would die. In the case of Boston, 4 or 5 million people. In the case of New York, 12 to 15 million. And if this were part of a war between the United States and Russia, every major city in the United States and in Russia would be destroyed in this way. And if NATO were drawn into the conflict, the same thing would happen to most of the cities in Canada and Europe. But again, these direct local effects, as horrendous as they are, are only part of the story. A limited war in South Asia puts 5 million tons of soot in the upper atmosphere. A war between the United States and Russia today puts 150 million tons of soot in the upper atmosphere. And that drops temperatures across the planet, an average of 14 degrees Fahrenheit. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperatures drop 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We have not seen conditions on this planet that cold in 18,000 years, since the coldest moment of the last ice age. And what we essentially would do with this war would be to create, in a matter of days, a new man-made nuclear ice age. Under these conditions, all of the ecosystems which have evolved since the end of the last naturally occurring ice age would collapse. Food production across the entire planet would stop, and the vast majority of the human race would starve to death. Under these conditions, it is possible that we would become extinct as a species. It is important for us to understand that this is not just some nightmare scenario. This is the danger which we face every day that these weapons continue to exist. If not by design, then by accident they may be used. We know of at least six occasions during the nuclear weapons era, and there are probably others that are still classified, but we know of at least six occasions when either Moscow or Washington began preparations to launch the nuclear weapons in the mistaken belief that they were under attack from the other side. Now we've been told throughout the nuclear weapons era that nuclear weapons deter their use, that we don't have to worry about them because no one would ever use them. But deterrence has already failed at least six times. 
the decision has been made to abandon this policy and to launch the weapons. And on each of these occasions, we received at the last minute when it became clear that the side that was contemplating nuclear war was not under attack by its enemies. Robert McNamara said of this situation, we lucked out. It was luck that prevented nuclear war. And we need to understand that. We've been phenomenally lucky and our luck is not going to hold out forever. Sooner or later, our luck will run out, and these weapons will be used if we don't take action. And that's the really important point that I need to make today. What I have just described is the future that will take place if these weapons are not eliminated. But it is not the future that must be. Nuclear weapons are not like some asteroid coming at us from outer space. They're not a force of nature. They're not an act of God. We built these with our own hands. We know how to take them apart. We've already dismantled more than 50,000 of them. We simply have not made the decision to eliminate the ones that are left. And that's what we need to do. This is the overriding issue of our era. And we need to understand that. There are many critical issues uh, that we all have to deal with. Susan talked about all of the different things that Tikkun Olam is trying to work on. And all of these are important issues that demand our attention. But we have to understand that if we do not prevent nuclear war, that all the good work that we do on everything else will be for naught. This is the essential thing which we must do. And there is every reason to believe that we can. It's a huge task. It's kind of intimidating. But we've already done this once. We faced you know, 60,000 nuclear warheads in Ronald Reagan in 1981. And we all put our shoulders to the wheel. And we got rid of the Cold War arms race. We stopped it. We reversed it. We got rid of all these nuclear weapons. We know that this can be done. In recent times, a couple of very inspiring stories. One is the uh, work that IBPNW did through ICANN. In 2007, the International Decisions for the Prevention of Nuclear War started a worldwide campaign called the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons with the explicit goal of securing passage of a treaty that would make nuclear weapons illegal, like chemical weapons and biological weapons are illegal under international law. In just 10 years, July 7, 2017, we secured a vote of the United Nations of 122 to 1, one abstention, adopting the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The ratification process for this treaty is now underway. And when 50 countries have, have ratified the treaty, it will become law. This is an incredible accomplishment of the international community, brought about largely by the work of civil society, working with some governments who were quite uh, keyed into the importance of doing this work. But it was the role of civil society that was really decisive. And interestingly, uh, when Ambassador Elaine White, the ambassador from Costa Rica, who chaired the negotiating session at the UN, was asked at a function in Washington last fall, why did this happen? Why did the governments of the world finally take this action? She had a one sentence response. Civil society taught the governments of the world the medical consequences of nuclear war. Period. Full stop. It's kind of shocking to think that the governments of the world needed to be taught this. They didn't know what the medical consequences of nuclear war are. But they don't. Uh, and the vast majority of the population doesn't either anymore. And so that's really the challenge before us. And to deal with that, here in the States, we have launched this campaign called Back from the Brink. Um, it, is, it was started jointly, well, it actually was started here in Western Massachusetts at a symposium we had uh, in September of last year, 2017, about the way that climate change was increasing the danger of the nuclear war. And a group of us at a workshop there uh, sort of inspired by ICANN, inspired by the freeze, came up with a plan for this campaign, which was then launched nationally by PSR, the Immune Concerned Scientists, Soba Bukai, the uh, Buddhist, or Buddhist organization. Um, the campaign is modeled on the freeze. It is, it, it, the central strategy is that if we get enough people around the country to endorse a different nuclear policy than what we have now, we'll create a national consensus to change US nuclear policy. And so we put together a very simple statement of what U.S. nuclear policy should be. It's five points, the most important of which is the fifth. It's a call on the United States 
to enter into negotiations with the other eight nuclear armed countries for an agreement that is enforceable, verifiable, and time bound for eliminating the rest of their arsenals. And um, this is something the US has said is our goal, but is never seriously pursued. So that's the most important point back from the brink, calling on the US to adopt this strategy. We also have four interim steps that we ask the US to do as these negotiations progress. First, we ask the US to renounce the first use of nuclear weapons. The US has refused historically to rule out using nuclear weapons, even against non-nuclear weapon states. We want that to change. Secondly, we ask the United States to take its nuclear weapons off air trigger alert. Currently, they can be launched in 15 minutes. This is extremely dangerous. It makes us vulnerable to cyber terrorism. It increases the chance of a, a bad decision being made uh, in a moment of crisis. This is going to blow up the world we can wait a day. We don't need to do it in 15 minutes. We want them off air trigger alert. Third, we ask that the United States change law to end the unchecked authority of the President of the United States to launch nuclear war. As it stands now, Donald Trump or anybody else in that office can, on his or potentially the future, her initiative, simply say, I'm going to start a nuclear war and give the order. And it does not require anybody else to sign on. <coughs> this is an extraordinarily dangerous situation. The framers of the Constitution more than 200 years ago said that only, uh, you know, only uh, Congress should be able to, to, to declare war. We've given one person the ability to destroy the planet. That should change. And fourth, we call on the United States to abandon its current plan to spend $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years, modernizing and enhancing every aspect of the nuclear arsenal. So that's the five-point program. And we are taking this program to communities all around the country, to faith groups, to labor unions, to professional associations, to civic groups, to town meetings, to city councils, to state legislatures, trying to get them to endorse this platform. And it is our hope and our belief that as happened with the freeze in the 1980s, if enough groups endorse this, essentially that becomes the national consensus that this is what our policy should be. And we are then in a position, as we do this, to put pressure on our leaders in government <coughs> to change US policy accordingly. Um, our group here in Western Massachusetts has gotten a number of towns and a number of faith communities to sign on to this, also some civic groups. Um, we want to expand this campaign very, very rapidly here in Western Massachusetts. Nationally, we've had some tremendous successes over the last few months. The U.S. Conference of Mayors voted unanimously, unanimously uh, to endorse back in the break. 30% of those mayors are Republicans. They voted unanimously for this. The Los Angeles and Baltimore City Council both voted unanimously to adopt back in the break. And the California State Legislature voted not unanimously, but overwhelmingly, both houses, to endorse this policy. We want to build on that momentum and really carry this campaign forward. So I'm going to stop at this point uh, with just a couple of quick closing words, and then we'll come back to this campaign and how we can build it in just a little bit. But one thing I just want to close with is this. Um, when I make a presentation like this, um, some of you may not have known this information before. Some of you may have known it but have forgotten it. By calling it back to mind or teaching you for the first time, um, it is putting an enormous responsibility on you. Because once somebody knows about this, um, there's a requirement to take action. If you see somebody fall down on the street, you can't just step over them. If you know your whole planet is at risk, you can't just go on with your business and not do something about it. And there is now, for all of us who know this information, a responsibility to take action. Um, and that is a burden. And it's going to be with us until we get rid of these weapons. But I, I really do want to emphasize that I think this is also in some ways a gift that I'm offering to all today. Every one of us wants to do something good with our life. We living today have been given the opportunity to save the world. That's what you could allow us. Repair the world, to save the world. And that's the best thing anybody can ever do in their life. So let's look at this problem in that context, from that perspective. And let's all you know, sort of make a pledge to ourselves that we are going to do what it takes. No one of us is going to do this you know, alone. But if each one of us does that part of the job which is ours to do, we're going to be successful. And we're all going to be able to look in the mirror and say, I saved the world. And that's pretty good. Thanks.